real quick, guys. If you want to take your real estate investing business from six to seven figures in the next 12 months, and you want to do without being a slave to your business, then you have to check out our scale community. You can get the full details at collectingkeys.com slash scale. But very basically, it is a community of like minded investors who are working to become the absolute top tier investors in their market. Along with three coaching calls per week led by Dan and myself, we also have a whole bunch of videos and materials that go into all the different SOPs that we use to run our business on a daily basis. This includes how we manage our sales team, how we hire, how we do our marketing systems, how we get the best assignment fees possible, how we do renovations, how we do all the different kinds of creative financing. And if you are serious about taking your real estate business to the next level, it is absolutely something that you should check out. So go to collectingkeys.com slash scale, see all the details and see if you're a good fit. Now we have like multiple solutions to the money problem, multiple exits when it comes to like wholesaling a deal with a tough, dealing with a tough title company. And we've gained all that through experience and honestly just talking to other people because like you learn about some wild shit that happens just by being around other people that also like to talk shop and tell you about their latest ordeal. What's going on, guys? Welcome to today's episode of the Collecting Keys or Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is your first time here. I am Mike DeHaan here with my co-host, Dan Austin. And on these Wednesday Mike and Dan show episodes, we talk about real estate investing business and whatever else we feel like for the week. So welcome, everybody. You are in for a ride today because Dan is feeling mouthy. Welcome to the Thunderdome. (laughs) Let's roll. We just literally spent 45 minutes talking before the show about all kinds of things that we probably can't record Yeah, because they're personal opinions on situations and people. And, you know, you can't put those things out there. Yeah, we put 90% of it out there, but that 5%, we don't want to get canceled. Yeah, exactly. We, we don't want, well, I mean, it's a small industry, right? And you can have opinions around what okay. people are doing in the space. And, you know, everyone has those conversations behind closed doors, just so you know who's down with what and what tactics are perceived okay amongst larger population. That's why you join the scale community and you get unfeathered access to our opinions, which good or bad. We don't record it here, but we instead record it on private phone calls that are only for those <laughs> members on our community yeah, coaching calls. Exactly. But, uh, you know, right. we've had a productive week, though. We actually had our biggest seven-day span that we've ever had from um, this past Monday, which was yesterday, to the Monday before. We had 11 closings, believe it or seven not. Seven days? That means we had more than one closing on the same day. We did. Several. And you know what the cool thing about that is? Is like, didn't really affect my day-to-day. No, like at all. <laughs> Wait, I guess the one that we sold our property, there's like a, maybe, wait, you signed for that one. I did. Trying, there's maybe a few emails back and forth because we had to, you know, dial in that wrap. Yeah, well, we had the wrap that we had. So in fact, I didn't even count that one. So we count that one, we actually had 12. There you go. That's not closing necessarily. Well, I guess it is the sale, but it's property that we already own. So does it yeah. count? It does for Instagram math. I'm rebranding. It's called a delayed wholesale. It's where you buy a property, hold it for two years and then sell it. That's actually a really good idea. You could totally sell a course <laughs> with like the delayed. I mean, I, dude, I see all sorts of dumb shit out there. I saw someone yeah. that was doing a, like a sub tail two or something. I'm like, it's, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's basically where you, it's where you buy a subject to and then you sell it. Whoa. Um, oh, wow. But so we had a big span though, tons of wholesales that managed to close around the same period of time. And then we had a very messy deal on, it was a, it actually was a going to be our largest assignment fee. It actually turned into a double closing because like two days before it was supposed to close, the title company decided that they were not going to give us title insurance because it's in this rural part of Washington state and they don't like investors, wholesalers, whatever. And they were basically like, oh, well, we're not going to give you title insurance with assignment fee that you have on here. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, well, that's fine. We'll just close on the property, whatever. But then they kn- they know that we're going to sell it to this next party. And yep. so they just literally made it their mission to try and make this deal like not close. Right. And I, I was like, who the fuck is this attorney in bumfuck Washington who's like literally trying to tamper with this deal? Because they were doing stuff like, okay, cool. So you're going to try and, and close on the deal. So we were going to assign it to our lending company that has all of our reserve money. And they were like, oh, no, you can't do that because 
the lending company we see in the operating agreement does not have the main business practice to be buying properties. So why are you buying properties? You shouldn't be doing that with LLC. I was like, what's well, none of your business? It's none of your business. Right? It's it's like, what if you were just like a business buying the property you were like renting? What if we're going to run our of... office out of there? I, exactly. I don't know. It's none of their business. And so we had to basically put all this money into our collecting keys account to be able to buy it from that. And there was like all these different hiccups and like stupid things. There was a couple of other things too. I can't even remember some of the other challenges that they yeah. were. The one thing, and then they got upset. Like, there's just too many entities involved. We're like, dude, we own all of them, but you keep telling us we can't use each of them, so we have to keep pulling them out. I, I mean, know. granted, we do have a lot of entities to choose from. Where most people, I don't think, I think that what they were probably banking on is that we'd be like, oh, we're screwed. We can't buy it this way because we don't have them. We're like, guess what? We got another LLC right here. We got another LLC right here. Yeah, they kept coming up with like weird stuff. And you're right, they mentioned. Several times, they, they we're getting uncomfortable. There's too many entities involved. And we're like, you keep telling us to change it. Yeah. Like, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It's just a bunch so, of jackasses. The thing about this uh, one, too, is it's like, this is a great example of like where they're putting their nose where it doesn't belong. Like this seller was a guy who he wanted to sell these houses. He wanted to move them fast. He knew what he was. He's like, I knew. I know I'm taking a hit on these. He's like, I know I could get more money for these. But he's like, I don't have time. And I don't have the money to do the work. I'm buying a new house, getting a new job, having a baby. I had all these things going on. Mom just passed away. And he's like, I literally know I can make more money, but like, I need these gone by this date for mm -hmm. a lot of reasons. So we're like, we can do that. We just, we're going to have to have it for less money than you could sell for on the market. And he knew that. So it's like, it's not the title company's job to like, tell us that we're trying to like scam this guy because we weren't. Yeah, it's just it is what it is. It's how that's how we operate. And that's what he needed that service. Yeah, everything was open. And he even like knew that we had another buyer that was going to be buying it. We took him to the house. We yes. <laughs> introduced the guys. He was there with us. They just didn't like the fact that we were like having this transaction on this deal. But yeah, it was such a stupid situation. The admin was upset that we're making twice for salary on, you know, this one deal. Yeah, it's called re real estate investing. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, so that was fun. I had, to, I had to scramble and come up with, you know, 300 something grand to get that figured out, which was, you know, fortunately having the lending business, we were able to do that. But on top of that, we had, we had a couple other ones that we've just been working on forever. Did we talk about the freaking buyer that we had that broke into the property and junked out all of the other I don't stuff? Know have we, we talked did, about right? that one on here yet? I don't think we have. I don't think so. That one's crazy. This is just more turmoil for like why this space is so insane. Like you can't even make up some of this stuff. And so the story with this one was we we're working on this with our with our partner in that market. You had the connection with the buyer. We've, you know, sold deals to this guy before, no problem. So basically we recorded, like not recorded, we funded and did everything like the previous Friday. And then come around Monday, the deal had not recorded yet because they were still waiting for the signed docs for the seller who did not live in the area. And basically the seller's brother was a tenant in there and was supposed to be moving out, but it hadn't recorded yet. So he hadn't left. So technically he didn't have to be out, right? Technically didn't have to be out. Like even then there was some challenges and things like that where like we're gonna do a lease back or like what was that gonna look like? We didn't know. We are still trying to figure it out up to the last minute, which is very common. The buyer, as far as he was concerned, he's like, I've sent the money and I've signed the document. This house is mine, which is not true. And so what the buyer decided to do, huge dirtbag move. Yeah. And it's super illegal. You can't do this regardless of if you own the property or not. Just like in general, this is a human rights issue here. Goes to the house, kicks the door in. I don't know how he got into the house. Maybe pick the lock. Pick the lock, something. <laughs> I don't know. Junks out the occupant's entire life, right? And the buyer's like, oh, it was a bunch of junk in there. I don't care if it's diapers and cat shit. It's not your stuff to take yet. Yeah, it's not your junk. One man's junk is another man's treasure. Yeah, junks out, while well, the, the occupants at work, junks out the entire thing and changes the locks and goes, cool, this is my house now. Like, bro, you don't even fucking own the house yet. What are yeah. you doing? Yeah. Right. And it was like a whole situation and ended up paying the the seller like eight thousand dollars in reparations. So he doesn't like, you know, sue us or sue the buyer or like do all this nonsense. And I'm just like a renegade person who's like the third party yeah. just decides to make a stupid decision and causes a huge problem for everyone involved they're, they're, and like literally commits a crime. 
Honestly. There's some dumb people out there. Like, I kind of want to encourage the seller just to call the police and be like, hey, I just had somebody break and entering into my home and yeah. take all my stuff. Take my all my stuff. It's like, that's crazy. Like, the fact that you would even think about doing that. I know. Just tells me that you're a dirtbag. Like, totally. Complete dirtbag. Complete idiot. And don't know anything about real estate investing. Like, you don't do that. It's not your no. house because you signed a document. It doesn't mean anything. I know. Yeah, it's like, nice job, buyer. We sold you like six properties. That means we're not selling you anymore. So good for you. You have to ever again, idiot. right? And when that happens, like I'm totally open to blasting a guy like that out on the internet and just be like, let people know like, hey, this is the kind of guy. If you want to operate your business with this type of person, feel free, but I'm not going to. Yeah, so yeah, just trash. You know, I, I heard a great quote a couple days ago and it applies to off-market real estate. It's every deal is an ordeal. Like, mm -hmm. it's so true. Like, you and I talk about this. Like, I've never heard somebody put it into three letters. Like, every deal is an ordeal. It's so true. Like, every deal can become problematic. Even the sim simplest ones, you're always doing mm -hmm. stuff. Real estate in general, because it is time-based. A lot of times with contracts, because you have, like, dates and times that you have to do certain things by. And title companies, no matter what they're doing, closing companies, no matter what they're doing, they always work on it last minute. So they're under, under the gun. And then they want all their information last minute. And you're like, you could have told me that two weeks ago, but never happens that way. So like everything just because of that is, is an ordeal. And then you throw in like crazy buyers that think they can just do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Crazy sellers that don't even know what to do next. And then like just dummies all the way through this create it. Just massive ordeals. You exactly. just get used to it. You just become numb to it and you just deal with it. Yeah, I mean, and the key is knowing kind of what rules you have to follow, how, like what kind of questions to ask mm -hmm. the seller that probably doesn't know yep. their own circumstance. So you have to ask the title company because also to you, title companies are kind of like lenders. You don't necessarily want to give them too much information because they might start to inquire deeper on the seller's, you know, yeah. estate issues. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. And you just want to like sort of tread that line so you can get some of these deals closed. Because if you're completely ignorant to the process about how real estate transactions work, around how title cool. processes work in different areas, around like the complexities that can actually arise, you're not going to know how to have solutions for them. And 99% of this business in off-market real estate, whether you're wholesaling, you're flipping, you're doing buy and hold, if you're going to direct the seller, 99% of your business is knowing how to solve these problems or yep. at least who you have to talk to to solve them and there's yep. really no way around that yeah being solution based is absolutely key i think uh we have a as so i think it, is it this friday or was it last friday focus or maybe it's two fridays from now i don't know i don't even know what day it is today but we have a friday focus coming up with a scale member shane who had a similar issue coming down to the wire had a i can't remember oh a buyer's lender could not fund the deal and he's That's wholesaling true. it could not fund the deal and so it's a great episode go listen to his kind of a solution really cool solution but like just basic wholesale deals, this happens. And if you got to be solution-based to solve the problems and it's about kind of experience and learning from others on like what options you have and what, like what tools you can pull out of your tool belt. Like in this, in this case where we're dealing with, where we had the double close, it was like, hey, the title company's acting really weird. What do you guys want to do? Oh, double close, let's go. Yeah, like the first time we ran into that though, it's like, what do we do? I know, if I remember. We got to, oh, we got to double close. Where are we going to get 300 grand from right now? Yeah. You know what I mean? Now we have like multiple solutions to the money problem, multiple exits when it comes to like wholesaling a deal with a tough, dealing with a tough title company. And we've gained all that through experience and honestly just talking to other people because like you learn about some wild shit that happens just by being around other people that also like to talk shop and tell you about their latest ordeal. Exactly. Or by listening to Shirley Collecting Keys podcast where yes. people actually are going through these things on a daily and weekly basis. I'm going to start tracking ordeals now. I'm not tracking deals anymore. We've done 500 plus ordeals. Mm -hmm. That's just my new metric. I'm going to just call it ordeals from now yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, at least, I mean, at, we probably have like five that weren't bad. Yeah. Yeah. They're still, they're still an ordeal. <laughs> Definitely like less than 1%. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hey, we really appreciate you being a listener of the Collecting Keys podcast. Did you know that we also are on social media and on YouTube? You should go and shoot us a follow on those as well. You can find both Dan and I on Instagram. I am at Mike underscore invests. Dan is at investor man. Dan, you can also find short clips from the show at Collecting Keys podcast on Instagram. And if you want to see our faces talking when you're listening to this show or you want to check out some of our crazy animated adventures, we've been putting together into some funny little web cartoons that sort of show the crazy stories that guests tell on the show, then you should go over to YouTube and check out the Collecting Keys channel. Shoot us a subscribe over there. It really helps continue to grow our audience. We 
We really, really appreciate it. Well, anyways, enjoy the rest of the show, you guys. We appreciate you all. Anyways, so yeah, that's been, you know, some of our dramas recently. And I'm excited to hear that one machine too, because that one was interesting. And I think yeah. that will be coming out in when this episode comes out. Two weeks. Three weeks. Two weeks. Oh, three, three weeks. weeks. Three weeks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Aside from that, how's everything else going? I know you've been working on growing the Simply Leads stuff. Any mm -hmm. great takeaways from that? So if you guys have missed this or you don't know Simply Leads, we acquired a marketing company that was our primary outbound marketing company. I don't know when we did this, like two months ago, three months ago. And yeah. we've been going in and trying to optimize it with our little bit of entrepreneurial business owner experience. But I know there's been some challenges. Yeah, we've been we've been focused on scale now. I think we started this kind of process like six months ago. We launched we relaunched the business to do SMS and cold calling for mm -hmm. other people. We're doing it for ourselves. I think we did that March first. And it's been great, honestly, like just taking the same systems and the same like processes that we've implemented in our business that we talk to people about, like when we're coaching them, it's like marketing, sales, operations, finance, like you have these four pillars of your business. And then it's just scaling things. One thing I've learned about business is revenue fixes all problems, mm -hmm. at least in the immediate. And so it's like, what do we have to do to grow revenue, marketing and sales, just like in a wholesale business, just like anything. And most of the people that are coming, this is why it's fun. Most of the people that come to me that I'm talking to, they're like, I need more marketing because I need more sales. They understand that it's a funnel. And outbound marketing is like, it's it's the top of your funnel, right? Like I would say the more top of your funnel would be, I don't know, like driving for dollars or something like that. And then that feeds into your outbound marketing. But calling and texting leads are going to be the top of your funnel. You're going to get a bunch of them and you're going to neck those all the way down to ones that are actually good. And then you're going to have mail in there, which are already going to be better than cold calling leads and texting leads. Yeah. But mail is freaking expensive. So you have a mail budget and then you have a calling and texting budget. And most of our clients coming in, they're like, I just need more. I've, I've already got my mail on lock, but I need more leads because I want to scale my business. And so that's, yeah. that's what we're helping them do. Yeah. And it, I think one of the benefits is because we have been running this kind of business for a while. We kind of know what mm -hmm. has been effective for us. And it's easy to like set things up that are effective for other people too. As a totally. result, and what one like PSA for people around this, because we get a lot of people who come in this and this is this honestly drives me freaking crazy. We got people who come in and they go to cancel after a month, not okay. because they're unhappy with the service. They literally go, I am getting too many leads and I cannot handle this. So I feel like I'm wasting my money. <laughs> we just had to do <laughs> we week into marketing with you us. Know? He was like, I have too many leads. I can't do this. I'm like, bro, I was like, what like, did you on. want? I know. <laughs> He wanted more leads, but yeah, that is, that is a tough thing. But remember, like calling and texting is a, it is like, you're going to get a lot, right? Like mm -hmm. just with our service in general, we're going to get people, we usually get people like 50 to 60 leads a month on top of whatever they're already doing. And so then you have to be able to filter those out of those 50, 60, 30 of them are probably going to go away pretty quickly, right? Like yeah. they're just not going to be great leads. That's just the name of the game, right? And then you're going to keep filtering down your funnel until you get like those two to three people that are probably going to become a deal. Yeah, that's just the name of the game in, any, in general with marketing. Yeah, and something that people need to understand about these outbound style leads, because we hear this a lot too, is people saying like, I want the leads to be warmer. Mm -hmm. yes. Understand that's not generally how leads that are generated by you encroaching on their day, Yeah, right? By you sending them a text while they're in a meeting at work or you calling them while they're at their daughter's ballet recital right? Yeah. Those leads are never going to be warm, like no. ever. Even if they are a highly motivated person, they're still going to be kind of cold and standoffish because you know how when you're like eating down with your family and someone calls a phone and you meet a thought of like, who the yeah. hell is calling me right now? Yep. They're doing the exact same thing. Yep. Right? Totally. And so your job as the investor, as the business owner, is to be able to get on a call, diffuse that situation and figure out if it actually is worth having it for their conversation yep. or not. And that's different than the direct mail that we do, which we always recommend people kind of stack in with the, the outbound stuff because direct mail, think about the story of the lead. They receive that piece of mail. They have time to look up your company. If you have a logo and website, and that, which I suggest that you do, they choose to pick up their phone and commit to making a phone call or doing outreach to you. Of course, that's going to be a more motivated lead yeah. because they chose to make the first move. They warmed up, right? Like they read your letter. Like you just said, they probably checked out your website. They've kind of looked at your letter for a couple of days. Yeah, I'm going to call these guys. Like they did all the warming up themselves. Outbound, mm -hmm. you're warming up. You're getting them in the lead or into your funnel. And you're saying, are you willing to have a conversation? 
And do you want to sell your house right now? Like those are the things we're trying to figure out. And like real estate agents know this. This is what they do. So like they just talk to anybody that owns a house. Like anybody that owns a house to a real estate agent is a lead. So for them, it's the same thing. Like, hey, this guy's willing to have a conversation and they want to sell their house in the next three to six months. I'm definitely going to, if I have to, I'll buy them a cup of coffee, whatever, right? So the same thing goes for off-market real estate, right? Like you're going to have to get these people into your funnel. You're going to have to warm them up. And then when they're ready, you need to be the person in front of them. And that's where then you kick in your follow-up process. If you call these people the first time and they're like, oh, they didn't answer. Yeah, that's, you got to do a lot more follow-up than that. That's why a lot of people actually call us and say, hey, can you do lead management? And we're like, yeah, sure. We can do lead management for you. That's what you need. Because that's the key, that's the key funnel piece coming in. And then who is doing all the follow-up? That's where most people fail in the execution of any marketing leads. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I feel like if you go and you look at any sort of other business, right, there's a lot of information around nurturing people. I mean, even as I, I even like realtors, right, they talk about getting involved in their community, going to places where people sort of get to know you. For some reason on the real estate investor front, we should pretend like that doesn't matter. Maybe it's because we're like marking the people yeah. that we know have financial distress or personal distress a lot of times Mm -hmm. you feel like they should be needing to move faster but understand that whatever situation they have they're calling you about you've already been dealing with that for like fucking years they're (laughs) not going to suddenly change their mind because you called them today Mm -hmm. right you know if they do that's an outlier that is a very very rare situation where you get somebody that calls you and wants to move forward in yeah. like the very immediate future. They've had that tax lien for two years and they've got two more <laughs> years before the county forecloses. So they're not in a rush, right? But you're going you're gonna to have to warm them up over a period of time. Sell exactly. them on what you can provide. Yeah, and engage them enough times that when they wake up on a nice Saturday morning and they're like, you know what? I am going to get that lien yeah. figured out today because it is getting ugly. You got to be the first person they think about. Or you got to be the one that happens to call them on that day. Mm-hmm they decide to make that decision. Yeah, that's a big part. I was actually uh, talking to a guy who's thinking about joining the scale community. And he's like, so you guys are marketing in the same market as me. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, how does that work? Like, if you teach me how to do what you're doing, I was like, dude, like we ask that all the time. It doesn't matter. Like half of this game is being in front of those people when they decide to sell. So you could send them one postcard one month and I can send them a different postcard with the same everything on it the next month. Then they call me instead of you. And it's just because they picked up my postcard first. And that's one of the reasons why we also don't stop mailing people once we start, right? We just keep sending it to them because we know there's a reason why they're on our list. And at some point, we want to be the first people they see or call when they're ready to make that decision. Exactly. And we have several people in the scale community that are local here to us in Spokane, in Northern Idaho. And yeah. all the time, they are posting about their wins, their new negotiations, their new deals, things that they're finding. Yeah. We're all marking the same list. That's not even in our system. Yeah, it's not even a lead in our system. Like they didn't call us. Same shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I actually, I, I was telling this guy too. I was like, like, I don't see other wholesalers like as competition in our market. I just, I just see them as like, I don't want to call them partners, but basically possible partners. We're all working together. We're kind of like on the same team and we're all blasting out marketing that's similar. Like there's nothing that's more cutting edge. Like, some people are doing the offer checks. And those are great. Some people are doing offer cars. Some people are doing handwritten. Letters. It doesn't matter. Outbound marketing, calling, texting, like we're all doing the same thing. And everybody at some point in time has too many deals or, or leads or they need more money. So they're going to wholesale deal and I'll be happy to buy it, flip it or keep it as a rental property and vice versa. I might be able to wholesale it to somebody that's a good friend of ours that might need a flip right now. So it's like we're all working together. Exactly. Yeah. And, and when it comes to marketing stuff, right, it's such common knowledge at this point that exactly. if you ever like join a community or hire a coach to figure that out, I recommend that you don't. Like honestly, like like go look on YouTube, go like yeah, look on, just Google how to generate leads, how to use PropStream, what trademark can look like. They're, they're very, there's either free or extremely cheap alternatives that you can use to learn these things. Like I saw, I've seen people giving away some of these different like courses and stuff. But, like it has a hundred hours of, you know, how we do our marketing and it's like 50 bucks. Yeah. On my first off, you're not going to watch 100 hours. You don't waste 50 bucks on that, to be honest. Crazy. Second off, that's how like repeated the whole marketing process is right now. And the thing that makes a difference, and like what you're saying before, Dan, of all of us marketing to each other, we all kind of know each other, is who has the better sales and follow-up process. That's 100% it. And the funny thing is, is, you know, we work with people in the scale community three times a week. We do these community calls. We harp on that so much. There is constant resistance from people. Like we, we literally have people that are coming in, like it's been in the group for like a year. All of you guys, if you're listening, I love you all very much. I just always like slap my head a little bit and laugh. 
when I see this is like people looking at like their KPIs, do you want to change their data? Do you want to change their marketing? Do one of these things? And I'm just like, what is your sales process look like? Mm-hmm. If you're not getting leads, that's one thing. You probably botched something. If nobody's yeah. calling the phone, you figure that out. We'll have people that have like six months worth of leads and they're like, I'm just not getting deals. I don't know how to get more leads. I'm like, well, how about you call all the people that are already in your system that you already paid for? Yes. You know, and, and one of my favorite quotes that you said, I don't even remember when you said this, Dan, I think this might have been at Keys Con last November. I think so. That your old leads are somebody else's new leads. Yep. Right? All the time. Might as well hit them. And they're paying to get them back into their system and they're probably exactly. going to close them if you're not calling them. Somebody's going to close them because mm-hmm. you sent them a letter, you cold called them, you did whatever for a reason. It's not like mm-hmm. you just pulled it out of thin air. They're yeah. on a list for a reason. Yeah, exactly. So something to think about as you're continuing to move forward. But yeah, the same reason stuff has been fun to build out. It's like more... I don't know, let's say like standard entrepreneurial business than trying to uh, get a bunch of guys excited to call crackheads every day, which does get does get hard. I know. Yeah, it's a lot more fun in the sense of like, I shouldn't say it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more simple, simplified. Lead generation simplified is actually our tagline, in case you were wondering. Yeah. But it's uh, much more simple in the fact that it's like, you're not building something novel like we have been with our partnership program, which is very challenging, as you know, as you're kind of leading the day-to-day of that. And so getting to use our skill set of marketing and sales into our business on Simple Leads has actually been really cool because it, it, it's not hard. Like just look at what other people are doing. Mm-hmm. And from like an ad campaign, a marketing and a sales, guess what? When we're working with Simply Leads prospects, like people that want to sign up with us, guess what we do? We're marketing to them and we're talking to them. We're setting appointments and doing our follow-up with them, making sure that they have all the information they need to make the right decisions, just like we do on the wholesale side. So it's kind of cool. There you go. Very relatable. It's a skill that I didn't know I built over the last five years or how long we've been doing this. I mean, it's basic business, right? And I also think businesses like that are pretty fun because you can, versus the wholesale side of the business where most of the time you're working with people that we are their last resort and they are making right. a very hard decision with something like this lead generation company, we are working with people that are excited. They're wanting to go and they are like, there's like more of a mutually beneficial exchange, it feels like. So yeah, they're usually in a growth and a growth mindset, a growth mode as opposed to preservation, which is our wholesale clients. Yep, exactly. So anyways, if you're interested in that, you should go to simplyleads.net. It's S-I-M-P-L-I, leads.net. Simply leads, yeah, dot net. Yep. We're going to get rich one day and buy dot com. It's pretty spendy. Somebody else has it. They're sitting on it. Yeah, it's like a weird website too. So don't go to like yes. simplyleads.com because it's something that's like not even related to like lead generation. Is it like for like a window cleaning company or something? No, I don't even know if it's that cool. I think yeah, it's, it's more like a weird. a weird like EOS style like consulting company. Oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, I have it pulled up. But in, in better news, if you're even remotely been listening for any time, you'll know that Mike and I had a property with bed bugs, which are challenging to get rid of. Also, I think we just, didn't have the right bed bug people to get rid of them. And turns out, not only do we have bed bugs, we had bat bugs, which are in your attic. So we got some quotes. Oh, for like, dude, I just realized something. Who? Bat bugs, because they're in the insulation. I don't know if that's why. They're in the bat. I understand that. I was thinking my fucking vampire bats, dude. That's what I've been thinking <laughs> of. Honestly, that's what I've been thinking of. And I Maybe that's a good point. I don't know. I was thinking that we had like little ones that were like flying around that were like blood, yeah. like well, they are blood suckers, I guess. But like, I was thinking like the animal, not that they were in the insulation, but that makes more sense. <laughs> I honestly, though, I don't know. Like I was thinking bat bugs because they're in the attic and yeah. like bats would hang out in your attic, like hanging upside down. It's because they're in the bat that's in the wall, dude. They're in the insulation. That makes Fuck, so much more sense. I don't know. So anyhow, it was like $7,000 to suck out the insulation, this whole thing. And I was like, I am not paying somebody $7,000. I know that we've got some crackheads around here willing to do cash work. So we found some people, still cost us a bunch, but they have this machine that they can suck out all of the insulation. It's like blow-in cellulose insulation. So we paid some dudes, we haven't paid them yet, um, to go up there with a hose and suck it all out, Mm -hmm. clean it all out. And then we have to go pay some guys in there to bomb the attic. And this will be like, we're going on s- over six months now with this freaking bug, bug broth. The worst part about it is, is they're like, yeah, we don't see any bugs in the adjacent unit. And I'm like, bro, yeah, I don't want to like, I don't want to stereotype anything, but it's, it's an immigrant that lives there that is like probably scared to tell the landlord that there's bugs because they don't want to get kicked out. They're section eight. They're, they don't speak good English. 
And so they probably were just, and they have a ton of stuff in there. Like it's packed. Yeah. In their house. And I'm like, you guys got to go in there and check, like really check. And they're like, this is like months into this ordeal. They're like, turns out she has bed bugs in her, in her unit. I'm like, no shit. You think the bed bugs just keep coming out of the walls? Like they're living. They've got a host that they've been eating on in this other unit. And they didn't say anything. These people didn't say anything. I mean, whatever. They don't speak English. So maybe they did. I don't know. But it turns out the whole building's infested. Nice. And turns out that bed bugs, they're like, they go through the walls. I'm like, technically they don't go through the walls. They just go through the cracks. It's a multifamily building. And it's like, you just crawl underneath the drywall, go into the other building. So it makes total sense that a bug would do that. So why wouldn't you? I was like, bomb the fuck out of this thing. Like make this thing like Iraq, like 1991 or whatever Desert Storm was. Like, I want this shit peppered with bombs, dude. And if it catches on fire and burns it down, I don't care. You absolutely do care. And we'll just say since now, if it does circumstantially burn down, the insurance company can come listen to this and be like, <laughs> yeah, I thought that they had weapons of mass destruction. So we had to bomb it. Classic American. I mean, that's, Class- that's why, that's why you went to war, man. And it just, yeah. it just spoke to you. But it did. It, yeah, I mean, just never ending. This is the, this is the thing that people don't tell you about section eight stuff too is like, yeah, you can get subsidized rent, all these things. They're not perfect. Like these people that tell you that they have Section 8 issues and that I've never had a problem because Good. no one's died in the property yet. Right. As soon as oh. that happens, <laughs> you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, and these are all like holdover Section 8 tenants. Like yeah. we moved two of them out. And so like we obviously didn't get to interview them or do anything. Like they're all relatively quiet, except for the one lady when I was there. She's like, I keep getting your water bill. I think you need to pay it. It says it's $3,000 past due. I was like, what is happening here? So it turns out the city was sending the water bill to one of our tenants and she wasn't paying it for six units. So I was like, that's cool. So we had a big backlog of water bill there for like, it was like two years. Nice. Thanks. But other than that, they don't really say anything. That was nice of her to tell me. Yeah. I mean, like that, yeah, they're easy that way. But as soon, my point being with, as soon as somebody dies, as soon as you have to get into the property, there will be issues, especially because there are like different rules around how you can handle Section 8 tenants and like walking through them and like disturbing them and all these things versus your own property. Part of the relationship that you're establishing with the city, Section 8 people, is that they kind of get special treatment and your job is just to shut up and stay out of it. Yeah, they they have inspections after like annual inspections. And the funny thing is, is the house will be burned down halfway, walls missing, and they're like, it all looks good, but you, you need a GFCI by the kitchen sink. <laughs> Right. Like, bro, there's no back wall. Right. <laughs> They're like, well, that's not on the list. The worst thing about our section eight. So we have, I don't know if you've seen where the building is. There's like a pretty big building. Yeah. I've been there with you. In the, no, the section eight building. Like this. Oh, the actual section about. eight building. No, yeah. no, no. Because I don't think they open it to like the public. Like I think it's like a three story building or something like that. Pretty big. And you can't call them. They don't allow you to call them. It has to be email. Yeah. And you're like, how do I even figure this shit out? Like, so they're like, they're behind a firewall, so you can't even talk to them. I feel bad for the people trying to get housing because it's, I think, the same thing on their end. They, it is. They can only email. Like, it's so weird. Yeah, I had a lady that was unable to pay rent. She basically got fired from her job during COVID and was going through that process. And she was like, I'm trying to, like, figure out how to get some rent. I can't. And then finally, it was, like, eight months later. It's crazy. I had somebody, like, reach out to me and so, like, hey, this tenant says they live in one of your units and they're trying to uh, figure it out. We want to verify that this is actually a person. They want to see the lease, want to do yeah. all those sort of things. And the funny thing is about this, and we'll, we'll wrap this up after that. So they wanted to see the lease that she had. They wanted to see any photos that I had with the property. <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. They didn't verify who I was, right? They, they didn't verify that I actually owned the property. They didn't verify that she was who she was, right? And so they could have been very easy for me to just like make a fake lease and send totally. some photos that I ripped off Zillow and they would just started sending me money. I never even thought about that. That's <laughs> just fascinating. I was like, Dude. this is the most unsecure thing that I've ever heard. Like, We should start going down and picking up homeless people and have like a unit that we just kind of use as like a daily thing, but we get rent, get like 20 homeless people and then we'll get Section 8 to run their credit or whatever they have to do over there, verify how are they do, and then we'll just collect 1200 bucks a month rent for some fake property we don't own. Dude, that was what that lady did at that seven unit that we owned. That was literally what she did. That's where I got the idea for it. Golly, you're right. It's so easy. <laughs> These people, it's crazy. But 
once they, and I will say this, once they're paying, once you get it started though, it's great. Cause it's like the quality of the property doesn't matter. Like, so when you're renting a property, what I mean by quality, I don't mean like you should make them live as well. What I mean is like in a neighborhood where you need to have like coarse countertops, new LVP, new paint, really well landscaped to get say 1500 in rent. A section eight, you could go in there with laminate countertops and, you know, just standard everything. And you're going to get 1500 because they look at what the market rent is for that area. Yeah. So when you're doing your renovation, if you're going to, if you're targeting section eight, I'm not saying like, again, they should live in squalor, but you don't have to have the same exact finishes to demand that full market price. They're going to give it to you anyways, because that's what market price is. So yeah. and then once they pay, once they, but they have to approve it. Like, again, you can't be a shithole, but they have to approve what the market rent is and what you're asking. Once they do, they just keep paying it. That's yeah. the cool thing. Well, and the benefit we've found as well with a good section of people that we've gotten is honestly, they, they tend to take okay care of the place because they're really grateful to not be in the alternative section of property, which is like really bad. Which is really trashy. Right. Yeah. So if you can provide like a decent one that they feel safe in, they feel secure in, is fully functional, they'll mm-hmm. take good care of your spot because they don't want to be kicked out and they don't want to have to go in and they don't want to move. Out. Moving is expensive. Mm-hmm. You think they have money to move because section no. eight doesn't give them a moving stipend. They're just going to pay their rent and moving is going to be pretty dang. I mean, it's expensive for anybody, but for, for somebody that's low income already, have to drop twelve hundred, fifteen, sixteen, two thousand dollars at least a month to move. That's pretty steep for them. So they tend to stick around. Yeah. So it's a way. Good, good little niche, but check with caution. Because as soon as you do have problems, they can get bad. Right, right. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. You should go and share the show with anybody who might find it interesting. We appreciate it. Um, anyone who's interested in dabbling in real estate or hearing some crazy stories, this was a pretty good one for them today because I feel like we had a, a good number of just like crazy stuff that's gone on recently, which, yes. you know, after a few months of things being relatively chill, that's what happens. So yeah. go ahead and share it. Really helps us out a ton. And we appreciate you guys listening. Talk to you guys next week. See ya. See ya.